I really had it in my mind that, you know what, we're going to talk about, when you, when you talk about being redeemed from the curse of the law, the curse of the law is really threefold. We've been redeemed from spiritual death. We've been redeemed from poverty and lack and sickness and disease. We've been redeemed from those things. Not going to be, we are. We've been redeemed from that, and now, because God's removed that off our life, now the blessing of Abraham could come on us as Gentiles, and now we could even receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and be saved. It's powerful. So, you know, in my manner of thinking, I'm like, okay, so we're going to really, first of all, you know, and I've been just kind of making outlines about we've been redeemed. What does it mean to be redeemed from spiritual death? You know, and then, then all of a sudden the Lord's like, boy, you know, I mean, literally, the Lord is like, oh, those, that's a really nice outline. But I want to talk about being redeemed from poverty and lack first. So I'm like, yes, sir. Okay, awesome. You know, this started for me about a year ago where the Lord came to me and he said, Tony, he goes, I have you quote this scripture, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, uh, a lot. He goes, I want to really... I want to really take you deeper in the revelation of that. And for the last year, he has. It's been wonderful. And now, he, just a couple weeks ago, he's released me to start teaching these things. So we're going to take our time, because you have to know you've been redeemed from the curse of poverty and lack. Do you hear that angelic sound when we say that? <laughs> but that, that's, that's literally true. Poverty and lack has no legal right in your life. The spirit of poverty and lack will never stop messing with you until you mess with it and say no more. But in order to do that, we can't do that in our own strength. So as we teach, I'm telling you, God's going to... See, it's just like Leanne was saying. We're not into thinking big or even positive thinking. Those things are really good. But we're into unlimited thinking. Because with God, we, we don't live like normal humans on this earth. Right? You know that. We're going to see, when you talk about spiritual death, we're alien beings in this world. Our Father owns this world, but right now it's controlled by Satan, but his lease is running out. But now Jesus... He got all of it back, and when I became born again, now I live in this earth by faith. I'm empowered to get wealth out of this world system. Nothing can stop me. So we have to know that we're blessed. So turn to Galatians chapter 3, and we're just going to start getting into this. Hallelujah. Remember, redemption means to ransom, to rescue, and to buy out. Jesus rescued us from the delegated influence, the kingdom of darkness. He ransomed us out. He paid the ransom. He bought us out. What did it cost him? His life. But because he did that, how did he do that? He was made a curse for us. So that now we've been, according to Colossians, transferred in to the kingdom of his dear son, where there now sickness and disease cannot be. Poverty and lack cannot live in this kingdom unless we choose to allow it in our life. Satan can't bring it in our life. So we need to gain knowledge of this. Galatians chapter 3 says this, Christ has, has redeemed us, half past tense, redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do that? Being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Why? So that the blessing of Abraham, right, can come on us as Gentiles. It comes on us through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So let's look at this. The curse has been removed off your life. Say this, repeat this with me. Christ, Christ. 
has redeemed me from the curse of poverty and lack, the curse of sickness and disease, the curse of spiritual death. He did that by being made a curse for me. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. He did that so the blessing of Abraham would come on me and that I would be able to receive. Jesus is my Lord, the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's what this is talking about. The blessing of Abraham, you got to realize this about the blessing of Abraham. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. It is based on covenant. This is something that God made covenant with Abraham. This cannot be broken. The guarantee of the covenant is Jesus. God cut covenant with Jesus. So this can never be broken. Nothing can stop this. The blessing comes on us. We don't chase the blessing. It comes on us and overtakes us. Here's here's how it works. God put something in us so that he could bring something on us. Right? Right. He made you new. He put a brand new spirit in you. The Holy Spirit came in salvation and now resides in you. He did that. Removing the curse off of your life so that now he could put something upon you. The blessing of the Lord. The blessing does the work. You don't do the work. You're going to see. See, why are we teaching this? Because you got to prepare your heart for wealth. Because it's going to take wealth to do what the church needs to do in this world. God wants you wealthy so that everything you have speaks about how good he is. You know in Psalm 145 verse 8 it says, The Lord is gracious. You know that word gracious? It means disposed to show favor. That means it is really easy for you to receive his blessing because he lives to bless you. He wants to get it over. Sometimes in Word of Faith circles, we get so intense about all this stuff and it, you know, all of a sudden, over the years, man, I now have, okay, you know, I started out three steps to the blessing of God operating in my life, but then I get really smart Pretty soon I've got 45 steps to the blessing of God and and it becomes so mechanical that I can never do it. No, God, your Father loves you. Everything He's provided for you, He wants you to have and He's gracious. He's disposed to get it over to you. The blessing that we're talking about, the blessing of Abraham, think of it this way, it is an empowerment. It's an empowerment that comes upon you that will produce good things in your life and through your life. It's an empowerment that comes upon you from God and it produces good things in your life. It produces good things in your life, not you. The walk of faith is a walk of rest. What I mean by that is we cease from our own works and now we just work out what God works in. So the curse of the law, you could say it this way, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of breaking God's law. Now for the children of Israel, there was over 400 and some laws, statutes, ordinances. But for us, it's one law. It's one law. See, sometimes people get an idea that it worked one way in the Old Testament and it works another way in the New Testament. Well, you've got to be real careful with that because it works the same way. Yes, God's dealing, the, the emphasis is, is opposite because we're born again. 
But now, do we live under law? Absolutely. One. Let me show it to you. Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 34. This is a command. It's a new commandment. We're going to see that if we keep the commandments, the blessing reigns in our life. John chapter 13, it says here in verse 34, Jesus says this, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Notice it's not talking about love in the world. It's talking about me loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. And it says, if I do that, how do I love? How do I love you unconditionally? Because that's the way Jesus loved me. Unconditionally, it, it's the word agape, love. It, it, it's, it's not based on the other person. So what, what Jesus is commanding, no matter what people do to you, it doesn't matter. You just love them. And don't worry, you can do it because when you got born again, the love of God was shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. So your spirit, man, is saturated. The only thing, the only thing that has problems when people sting you a little bit, that's just your flesh. It's not you. So Jesus is saying this, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then it says in verse 35, it says, by this... As we love each other unconditionally, all men, now this is talking about people who don't know God, all men will know that you're my disciples, that now we're the follower. If you have love one for another. Now, if you look at John chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus said to those that believed on him, if you continue in my word, you're my disciple. So continuing in the word and loving your brothers and sisters is going to be right together. You'll never be able to walk in the love of God if you don't continue in the word of God. But then it goes on to say, if you'll do that, then you will know the truth of the word of God. And the truth, when you know it, makes you free. Not think you know it. You could have 25 series on faith and still walk by sight. Right? This is not about what you know here. This is about what you know here. So this is huge. Now, let's finish this thought. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, it says this. We know that we have passed, this is past tense, passed from death unto life. From death unto Zoe life. We know this because we love our brothers and sisters. If you're not walking in love, you don't really... This word know, this is a revelation knowledge No, This is not know in your head. You want to know if you're really saved? That's how you're going to know. As you walk in love, it says, you'll know that you've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. That word abide means to settle down and remains in death. Verse 16 says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. See, we perceive the love of God by imitating Jesus to our brothers and sisters. This is why... In, in the epistles, it says, we comprehend with all the saints. You don't comprehend this alone. 
the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love of God. And if you keep going with that, it causes you to be filled with all the fullness of God. See, so, so this is, whenever we say the law, don't think of all, see, you know, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, that's what, that's what they, he was talking about in the Old Testament. New Testament, it's the law of love. And if you keep the law of love, you'll keep all the other ones. Here's the cool thing. You don't have to keep them in your own strength. Right? That, that's the cool thing. The Holy Spirit's here to help you. All of heaven is here to help us. So the blessing of Abraham, let's jump back here now. The blessing is an empowerment that will produce good things in our life. The blessing is for us. It looks a lot like the anointing. The, God anoints us, but the anointing, although it operates very similar, it is to bless others. I am anointed by God as a pastor and as a minister. Right now, I'm walking in the anointing. It's the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the anointing is the person. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. But that anointing is not for me. It's for others. But the blessing that we're talking about here, that is for me. That is for you. You must walk in the blessing because everything. See, right now, the Camry sitting out in that parking lot, although it talks to people because I got a little license plate that says 3 John 2, and they come up and go, what is that? Right? So I'll tell them what that is. It opens doors for me to witness. It doesn't talk to them as good as it will someday when I don't have a payment on it. Because I'm still, I'm still in the Babylonian system. God wants us to get to the point when you go buy a car, you just write a check. That, that's, that's, that's where we must get, guys. So that, so that when somebody comes and visits our high school youth group and they pull in the parking lot, and it's kind of like when I moved to California. I had a 73 Brown Maverick. Three on the tree, and, and the, the gears would get stuck. And that was a real bummer because you had to get out and you had to lift up the hood and you had to take the gears and put them together, put down the hood. Now that's bad in Newport Beach, California, where you got Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And, and then I pulled into Corona Del Mar High School and there's Porsches, there's, there's Ferrari in a high school parking lot, right? I still remember it was, it was 19, gosh, what would that have been, 79? No, yeah, 79, wow, dating myself here. So I'm in, I, I'm in, I'm in Corona Del Mar High School, and uh, I see this girl walking down the hallway, and I'm talking to one of the guys on the basketball team. I'm like, look at that girl. I go, that girl looks just like Brooke Shields. And he's like, dude, that is Brooke Shields. I'm like, she was a sophomore. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is fantasy land. See, I couldn't even put my, so I pull into this parking lot. You could imagine how special I felt with my brown maverick, you know? I don't think anybody, I mean, I, could you imagine? I couldn't keep my basketball in the trunk because it would roll out. It's called rust. People in California don't know what that is, but in the Midwest, wow, right? I got a pair of jeans for Christmas while all these people in this high school were going to Europe. and they're going, for, for my graduation, I got it. Now, now, some of you young people might not know what this is, but I got a typewriter. <laughs> a friend of mine got a condo in Laguna. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, right? <laughs> the blessing is an endowment of power that comes on you as a believer for the, pur for the purpose of producing good things in your life. The blessing produces them. It says, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, but he adds no sorrow to it. That's, that's no toil. To activate, now see, the blessing is the voice of faith activated. Because the blessing of God is in your life. The curse has been removed so the blessing could come upon you. It won't do you any good. You will not sense it unless you activate it. To activate the blessing in your life, you must believe and speak the word of God. And that activates the blessing. 
You need to know this. The God of heaven wants to prosper you. If anybody tells you different, here's the question. I don't care how many letters they have by their name. I don't care if they're called a pastor or a bishop. You know, I don't care if they're called the pope. It doesn't matter. The question is, if they're talking about how that, well, you know, it's humble to live in lack. Just ask them the question, okay, could you please show me? I mean, you could even be as brave as to go, just show me one scripture. Where, where does it say that in the Bible? In reality, you got to have two to three for it to be established, but you could let people off the hook and just say, just show me one. And, and then this is what you'll hear. Well, in my opinion, and theologian so-and-so, because they can't. Because see, first and second imaginations is not in the Bible. Right? You would think so, what some people are teaching. You must know that God sent his son to become a curse for you. Why do you think Jesus, when he hung on that tree, hung there with a crown of thorns on his head. The thorns signify the curse. You could see it right in the book of Genesis. you got to know that he did that so to remove the curse off of you so that you could be saved and walk so that this blessing could come upon your life. This blessing will pay your house off this year. It'll pay all your debts. You know, this year is actually a jubilee year in Israel, but... Every year for a child of God, Jesus instituted an eternal jubilee. Do you know eternal jubilee means debts are canceled? That means if you've blown it and got in debt and then your life is a mess, don't worry about that. Repent and start believing the word of God and he'll he'll eradicate all that. Proverbs 11.32 says, the righteous shall be repaid while they're in the earth. Everything the enemy's stolen from you. Jeremiah, you don't have to turn there, but Jeremiah 29.11 says this, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. They're thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now we have to define this word thought, because the word, the Hebrew word thought means plans and purposes. So it goes deeper than God just had a thought about you. See, God doesn't say anything or think anything randomly. Everything he thinks, everything he says is for a purpose, and that purpose is to show you favor. So if we read this literally, God is saying, for I know the plans and the purposes that I purpose towards you, saith the Lord. They're plans and purposes of peace and not of evil. That means God's not going to allow you to get in a car accident to teach you something or give you a little prostate cancer or, you know, a little arthritis so that, no, so that he could test your faith. He doesn't have to test your faith. He knows where your faith is at. Trust me, there's another one in the earth that will test your faith because he doesn't know where your faith's at. He's he's looking for the wine in your voice because faith doesn't work when you have a wine in your voice, Right? He's he's looking for your countenance. Ooh, look, Tony looks a little down today. That's awesome. I think I'll throw some nice little thoughts there, see if they'll take them. You know, hey, go get that video. Remember when he really blew it like 10 years ago? That's what Satan does. But we are to, the Bible says we're to believe and speak the word of God always. God's plan for his children is that they would have a prosperous future filled with hope now when i say hope bible hope is not gosh i bought a lottery ticket i sure hope that i win which means i may or i may not i sure hope i get a raise this year i may or may not no that's not bible hope bible hope the word is always defined a confident joyous expectation so bible hope is your see god said it so now you're expecting it it's not if it's going to come to pass no it's already done and that's my future 
I know it's coming. That's how we live. God wants to put you where you would never even imagine putting yourself. Yeah, but you know, I've heard so many people, you know, I, I don't need much. You know, I'm not, I'm, not all, I'm, not, I'm not carnal and, you know, materialistic. I don't need to drive a BMW. I, you know, I don't need to drive this. I don't need to live here. Well, hold on a second. Are you living for yourself? What if God wants you to drive something? Because there's somebody he wants to reach that's your fruit. And he wants, he wants that person to walk up to you and go, Wow. I know what you do for a living. You make this much money. How do you drive this? Amen. Oh, it's, um, it's Jeremiah 29, 11. What, what? No, God gave me that. Or maybe live there. See, see, here's what's happening in the body of Christ. We're looking at everything based on our education, my talent, where I came from. Well, I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Join the club. We all did. I don't care if you grew up in one of the richest houses in the world. You're on the wrong side of the track until you get saved. And then you're on the right side of the track. Right? Because you're either in the kingdom of darkness or the king. Who cares about what neighborhood? But what neighborhood should you live in? That's very specific. I could show you Greek words that God has put you in this place at this time, so you better live in the house he wants you to live in. Yeah, but I can't afford it. Yep, you see, you're living for yourself again. Because in every one of you, it would be so nice to live in a nice house. Wouldn't be as nice as giving a house away, because that would just turn you on. See, the thing that bothers me about that car is I can't give it away if I wanted to because I don't own it. Now, I, I think you think I own it. Oh, Pastor, man, he owns that nice car out there. Yeah, if, if I stop making those payments, the reality that I really don't own it would settle in. Amen. I'd walk out one day after church and go, hey, where's my car? <laughs> right? Oh, the bank's car. See, God doesn't want us part of the system. So you have to... You have to see, you can't try to go, okay, I'm going to tough it out. I'm really going to try to think unlimited. No, nope, you can't. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about it here. It's got to, the word of God has to come out of your heart and wash over your mind, pull out all those plants and renovate your thinking so that now, see, in God, I, I mean, you could sense this. Some people, boy, they have trouble when you talk about money. I'm not sensing too much of it, just a little bit, but that's all right. You're going to be okay. Um, it's not about you. See, if you seek things, and if you're ever listening to some prosperity teacher, and it's pointing you to think about things, it's a wrong focus. Because you can't, you can't live in God's system and seek the things. To be honest with you, you love them more, or not love them, you, you enjoy them more because they don't have you. Like in our life, everything that we own is subject to be given away. Everything. And we enjoy doing that. We, we've, we understand we're stewards. But we also understand, you know what? I am not walking in the degree of blessing that I need to walk in as a pastor. I need to be debt-free. Right? Now, if I calculate my salary at how long it's going to take me to get debt-free based on that, Wow. Thank God I'm not limited to that. And neither are you. God wants to bring other income streams. God can make you a multimillionaire tomorrow. Really, one idea. But you, gotta, you have to prepare yourself for this because wouldn't it be awesome to, like I, I remember Keith Moore when I was at Rama. Keith Moore's one of the teachers. Do you know he was sowing more into the ministry Rama, than he was being paid. What? But, but why is that? You know, one day he came to class, and he's teaching, and finally, you know, Keith is a little, he, he, he's, back then he was a little rougher around the edges. But he told the class, he's like, 
stop looking at my feet. He goes, yes, I was at a gas station before I came, to, came here, and God told me to give this guy my shoes. So forget about it, you know, they're, they're whatever. So I gave him my shoes. I would have other ones on. I just didn't have time to go get them. My wife's getting them. I'll have them by next hour. Don't let that distract you from what we're doing today. Right? Because why? Every, I'm a steward. Everything I have is his, and nothing has me. So you're going to see that. To, to walk in the blessing, things can't have you. But I'll tell you, greed can really grow where there's lack. You could, you could have more money than you could ever waste and be filled with fear of losing it before you die. So we're talking about freedom. See, John 10.10 10 says this, the thief, he comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life, the Zoe life of God. See, sin is not the ultimate problem, it's death. But once you receive spiritual life, now the blessing of Abraham could come upon you. And that they might have this life more abundantly. That word in the Greek literally means that they might have the Zoe life of God in superabundance, in an overflowing way, in a more than enough way. Why? Because we're to live our life giving. We're, we're to spend our time, instead of trying to spend our time at the kitchen table, trying to figure out how to make ends meet, we're, we're to spend our time going, okay, Lord, who in, my, who in my local church can I bless? Who's struggling? Let, let me be used to be their miracle. When they need $503 to pay this bill, let me be that person that I could come up and go, hey, Carissa, hey, Pastor Edwin, can, see that person over there? I don't know their name. Can you go give them this? And don't tell them who it was. Or tell him who it was, God. Because in reality, God's who did it, right? See, this is huge. James chapter 1, you got to know that God wants you blessed. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says what? Every good and perfect gift comes from above from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So if it steals, kills, and destroys, or if it's not good or perfect, it's not from God. If it's, if it's good, if it brings you into abundant God kind of life, it's from God, and there's no variableness in God, which means it's for every one of us on a level playing field. God has, He loves all of us the same. He's provided for all of us. If he's done one thing for one person and not another, he would vary. That's the, he would violate that Greek word, but he doesn't. He, it's all there for all of us. Psalm 35, 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad. This is, this is your father talking to you. I want you to shout for joy. I want you to be glad why? Because you favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say, how often? Continually. Why? Because you activate the blessing with your mouth. Let them say continually. What? Let the Lord be magnified, which takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God, see, there's another scripture in Hebrews 4 that God says without faith it's impossible to please him. So this is tied together. God wants you to know it brings him pleasure when you walk in the blessing. Brings you pleasure. So you have now, if you look at an aerial view of Moses and the children of Israel, Egypt represented a land of not enough. They were slaves. They were told what to wear. They were told where they can go. They were told what they would do for work, right? That was Egypt. 
That was the delegated influence of darkness in our lives. We had no choice. But now the wilderness, when they came out of the land of Egypt, which is a type of us getting born again, and now they're in the wilderness, this is a land of just enough. So here they're out in the wilderness, and God is, God is teaching them. They, that was an 11-day journey that turned into 40 years. And, and you know, when I was 25, I didn't relate to that. But now that I'm 55, whoo, yeah, you could waste 40 years. You could blink and waste a decade. You know, and, and so now, but the wilderness was just enough. We had manna burgers, filet of manna. After a while, you know, manna cakes, I mean, whatever, right? And, and it's like, and, and you, just, you just have enough for today, and tomorrow there'll be more. Of course, they tried to save it up, and then it rotted, right? Because with God, see, there's something about God you got to know. When he cooks, the Bible says it this way. It doesn't say when he cooks, it says he makes. Same thing, right? all things new. So is the land of just enough. But that, that so, so don't die in the wilderness. We've got born-again, spirit-filled Christians dying in the wilderness because they won't become a viable part of their company, their local church. We've got people, well, I just don't believe in that tithing thing. Well, I just think that, you know, the tithing, that's not New Testament. Really, have you ever read the book of Hebrews? Well, you know, tithing, that was under the law. Really? Have you ever read the Old Testament? No, no, that was hundreds of years before the law. I, would, I could argue a pretty good argument that it was in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, but the tithe, that's not 10%. That's, I'm a New Testament believer. I'm just led by the Spirit. I could do whatever. Okay, okay, but you're violating the whole thing because the very word means 10th. We do weird things in the church we who are ministers, we, we fight wars. I'll dare you say I have to dunk somebody. I could baptize them by sprinkling them. It's like the word means immersion. But then if we get on the same page there, we get carnal again. It's like, okay, I can't fellowship with you, brother. I can't love you. I don't even want to talk to you because you say I have to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I say... I should just have to, I could baptize in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, you just said the same thing. Because in the name of Jesus is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, so take somebody out and hose them down. Because if, the, if their heart's right, it's going to be a great experience. Let's get, let's get off of this what I think about the word. No, we got we to gotta get New Testament taught. We have, it has, and it has to work throughout the whole Bible. What am I saying? We got to do it God's way. God doesn't line up with us. Let's just face it. You don't want to give 10% of your income to God. And here's the thing. If you study the tithe, you don't have to give 10% to God. As a matter of fact, you can't. You can't give him any of the tithe because it, it's not yours to give. It's his. So he says, bring it. And then he says, test me on what I'll do with the other 90%. Oh, you haven't, you haven't seen anything yet. Right? I could teach a series on tithing. The only reason why I wouldn't is because it was hard on me last weekend not preaching. And, but the best series on tithing I could ever teach would be to just bring up all the tithers in the church. And just let them tell their story. Because once you tithe for two to three years, breathing's optional, eating's optional, living in light is optional. But the tithe, oh, no, I'm not touching that. But then we all laugh and go, yeah, but we'll never have to worry about this or that. And, right? right? Yeah. And I'm not meddling about the tithe. My goodness, you're never going to see me beg anybody up here. If God can't keep this thing afloat, then whatever. But guess what? He keeps it afloat in, in a big way. We haven't even begun to tap into the big way yet. So the promised land, though, crossing that Jordan River into the promised land, this was a land of more than enough. Your inheritance is more than you'll ever need. 
It's more than you'll ever need for you, your family, and your children's children. It's more. God is not the God of just enough. He's a God of more than enough. So you have to renew your mind. These scriptures will renew your mind to start thinking this way. Listen, just because you're going to be a college student, just because you don't think, well, I'm not working, I'm going to school, so what? You know, I tell my kids that all the time. You know, my, my daughter's husband, he just finished his second year of medical school. You know, when you're a medical student, it's not like you could work and go to school. When you ask a medical student how much they study, they kind of look at you like, what? I mean, I eat, I sleep. You know, like for Eric, you know, I'm, I'm in the Word. I, I eat and I sleep. I'm in the Word. I spend a little time with Sarah and, and Asher as much as I can, and then I just study all the time. So they live on student loans. But the good news is, he has an eternal jubilee, which is debt cancellation. So what does that mean? God will pay his student loans. Amen. Amen. So the promised land, it's a land of more than enough. It is a land. Now this is your inheritance, our inheritance. It's not a, it, it's not a land of Canaan. It's all the blessings of God, all the promises that he promised us. It's a land of sowing and reaping. You can't increase in the kingdom of God unless you sow. So, so you, you understand that. But here's the cool thing. You have been made to sow. It's what really turns you on. It's a land that is not watered by your foot. In Egypt, as slaves, they would get and have to pedal this thing to run this aqueduct system to get water to everywhere. But no, God says, no, in this land, I'm gonna, you just serve me and I'll bring the rain. It's not watered by your foot. You won't toil. No toil. So here's the progression. I would really encourage you. This is the way the Lord has given this to me. Years ago, it'll help you. The progression. Hope comes from knowing God's will. You could put it this way, expectation comes from knowing God's will. When you know his will, you could expect something. Hope is future. Your future becomes very bright. So hope comes from knowing God's will. Knowing God's will comes from gaining knowledge of God's word. Right? So now we got to know this. Knowing God's will comes only one way from, no, from ga gaining knowledge of God's word. To know God's word, you must have an understanding of who he is. See, you could read these scriptures about how God wants you blessed but boy, when you get to know him as your provider, when you really get to know him personally, you're like, he is the God of more than enough. If I need $10,000 and I believe him for $10,000, I smile because it's impossible for me to only get $10,000. It'll always be more because he's the God of more than enough. So to know God's word you must have an understanding of who God is. And the last one, wisdom, the wisdom of God gives you a revelation of who God is. So this is how it works, guys. I, I, I do Proverbs 4. I put God's word first, right? I, I give it my undivided attention. This is Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. This is the prescription on how to take the word of God. I have to decide to put it first. I give it my undivided attention. I never let it depart from my eyes. That means as I walk throughout my day, I always see myself being, having, and doing what the word says. I always see him as, as doing and being who he says he is. I keep it right in front of my eyes. That enables me to keep his word in the midst of my heart. And then his word is life to those that find it 
and health to all their flesh. So I start meditating in his word day and night. What, how, what do I mean by that? To meditate. I use my meditator, my mouth. It's like a cow chewing a cud. I didn't really know what that was when I first went to Rama. so then somebody explained it to me. That's disgusting. But, you know, it's where a cow will eat something and then swallow it, and then they bring it back up and chew it some more. Nasty. But this tastes really good. It tastes good the first time you have it in your mouth, and it drops down in your heart. But then when you go, and you bring it up in your mouth again, it tastes even better. And then by about the 50th time, you're going, oh, I can't live without this. Am I saying that right before lunch? Ooh. No, you meditate in the word. What that means is I walk around. I keep it in front of my eyes. All my circumstances are saying you're going under. And, and yet I'm going, oh, Father, I'm so thankful it's written I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm so thankful you always cause me to triumph. And see, what I'm doing is I'm bringing the word out of my heart, and it's in my mouth, and then I keep bringing it. And what's happening is now light the light of revelation is going off. The Holy Spirit is bringing revelation to the word of God and now it becomes a lamp to my feet. It shows me where to go next. But I'm not even worried about the minefield of this valley of the shadow of death that I'm leading in because no, he's my pastor. The Lord is my shepherd and I'll never want because he, he leads me. How does he lead me? By the Holy Spirit. So now as I'm doing this, this progression starts happening. Pretty soon, there's an expectation in me because now I'm knowing God's will, right? And, and why, why do I know his will? Because I'm gaining knowledge of his word, revelation knowledge. And, and see, really, let's go a little deeper. Really, the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm gaining knowledge of who he is. And so as I'm meditating in the word now, the wisdom of God, which is not of this world, will come out of my spirit and it'll wash over my mind. And what it will do is it will show me and tell me exactly how to apply the word of God to bring victory in every area of my life. See, prosperity, don't think we're talking about money. Prosperity is who you know. Prosperity comes by you gaining, because you're getting to know him, you're gaining the ability to tap into his ability to meet every need, every want, every desire in your life. So you don't need a million dollars in the bank. You have an unlimited supply that will always be there when you need it. Because why? Because he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the self-existent one that always reveals himself, who looks ahead and always provides for you. Everything that you will ever need in this life to do everything has already been provided. And your mouth activates it and brings it right on the scene. Get that? Isn't that, isn't that powerful? Hallelujah. I'm going to go about two more minutes here. 3 John 2, we mentioned that. I love this scripture. The word of God goes on to say, see, you've got to believe God's good. It says here, beloved. Now, in the King James, it says wish, but our prayer lives is not wishing. The Greek word is pray. Beloved, I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So we see that how you tap into all these blessings, you have to get your soul prospering. That's the renewing of your mind. The word must be first. Prosperity, here's a definition for you, is an understanding that comes from God's word about what has already been done for you. Not what that's going to be done, you go to God and say, man, I need $500 for this bill tomorrow. God's not going to have to decide, well, do I want to do this or not? No, 2,000 years ago, before you were ever born, that $500 is already there. So you just got to be willing and obedient so you can eat the good of the land. Because sometimes when you need $500 and you have 
$25 and you're not getting paid for a week and, and you need that $25 for gas, God might say, see that guy in that 7 Series BMW? I want you to walk up to him and give him $25. And you're like, Phew. in your mind you're going, well, first of all, he doesn't need it. Second of all, I really, what am I going to do? See, that's why you got to keep the word in front of you. Prosperity, prosperity is an understanding that comes only from God's word about what has already been done for you. Do you see that? See, you could see it, but you gotta, you gotta, you have to meditate in scripture to really walk in this. Prosperity is spiritual. Money is natural, but it produces spiritual results. God will always require us to do something natural and he will turn it into something supernatural. You bring the tithe to the Lord, you sow and bring offerings and sow offerings into the kingdom. What does he do? He opens the windows of heaven over the tither and pours out blessings in every arena of their life. He, for the person giving those offerings, what, what does he do? He brings it back to them. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He causes other men supernaturally to bring it back. You do something natural, he does something supernatural. Do you get that? So we're going to keep going. We're going to take our time with this. And then after that, we're going to get into being redeemed from the curse of sickness and disease. Now, I could probably teach years on each of these. But we're going to, I'm telling you, I'm so excited because the Lord is just, he, he's graced us. We're going to get into some things that are really going to help all of us. You have symptoms in your body, you don't have to. We're going to learn how to walk free from all of this. Amen? Oh, I sure love you. You know, you guys are so receptive. I could, I could sense it. The hunger, it's wonderful. Hallelujah. Let, let me pray for you before we're dismissed.